Okay, so um, the next speaker will be talking about visualization and storytelling, which I think is also part of the data science spectrum that we often overlook. Uh, we chance upon his talk, which was quite concise and uh, worthy of sharing uh, in the recent uh, Shraddha and Abu conference. So, uh, Mr. Amit Kapoor has an extensive background in uh, management, consulting, and data science. He asked me not to elaborate more <laughs> because he would like to describe himself more. So, let's give our hands to Mr. Amit Kapoor. Thank you, Zaldan. Uh, am I audible at the back? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Um, I'm going to try and make it as interactive as possible. I mean, I can go through this at a very rapid clip. Uh, but just so that you know, we feel like <laughs> it's just li more than a talk, I guess. Um, my background, yes, is in management consulting. So I did about 10 years of management consulting. I'm an engineer, an MBA, and then I did about 10 years of management consulting. But now I kind of focus on teaching uh, basically in the space of data, stories, and visuals. So kind of the intersection of that. Um, so I, I do a lot of stuff in data visualization, mostly in business context, but I also teach in data science context. So in the context of uh, you know visualization in R, Python, and data science also, and uh, my bias is really to kind of talk about basics because you know uh, you know you can obviously learn a library, you can learn the tools very easily. Uh, I just want to inspire people to kind of look at these topics in a way so that then they can kind of build their own skills around that, right? So that's kind of my bias. Uh, I'm going to talk about visualization in general. Uh, so I'll start with kind of some basic stuff and then go all the way up to multidimensional. So this is a talk I gave in Strata, and that's where I met Zaldan, and he asked me to come here, so I'm here today. Um, feel free to stop me at any time to ask questions. Uh, probably a question that you're thinking is what your neighbor is also thinking about and is, has, is not asking, so just feel free to you know kind of ask a question, and uh, I will either answer it, or if I think it's against the flow of the talk, I will just ask you to kind of pick it up at the end of the session. Is that okay? Yeah? Are we with me? Yes. Okay, good. So visualizing multidimensional data. I'm gonna start with a story. Um, and this story is about Flatland. Uh, uh, Flatland is uh, kind of a romance in many dimensions. It's not really a romantic book, but it's a book written by Edwin Abbott in 1884. How many have, has anybody read, read this book? One, two, three, four, okay, smattering of hands, right? So, uh, or five in the back. And the story is, for a simple, it's a story about a square. Uh, it's a story in a two-dimensional space where every uh, person or every object is either a line, a square, uh, a triangle, and it keeps going up, you know, to eventually become a circle, right? So it's in two-dimensional, everything is a geometrical shape. And uh, the protagonist is a square. And square is nothing but a line in two-dimensional, right? So if you look at a square in two-dimensional, you'll only see a line. And the story really kicks in when the square is visited by a sphere, right? And the sphere is really interesting because the sphere is in third dimension, and he can sink in and out of the two-dimensional space so he can disappear, he can become big, he can become small. And no matter what the... Uh, square tries to grow, I mean, tries to look at it, he cannot understand. He cannot understand how this is happening, right? So the sphere is not able to explain to him, you know, how this is all happening because he lives in two dimensional and the sphere is in a third dimensional. So this literally at the end, the sphere pulls the cube or pulls the square up into the third dimension and becomes, shows him that he's actually a cube, but in the two dimension, he's just a square. So it's a beautiful book. Very good at showing this uh, analogy. And I really want to help you see that world in a many ways. So, you know, kind of show rather than tell in one way, right? So my bias here is going to be show more than kind of tell you because, you know, telling will not explain it. Hopefully, if I can lift some people and start to look at things in a different way, then it would be interesting, right? Okay? So we are visually wired. And that's why visualization works. So 50% of the brain is used for visualization. We can actually come into a place like this and understand the whole scene and set up very quickly in less than 100 milliseconds. And we're really visually wired. And actually, we are visually wired in a way that our visual perception is probably much better than, say, logical or linear or com computational skills that we have, right? So if there is any advantage we have over computers right now, it's probably still in the domain of visualization, right? or understanding visual cues. And 
What is visualization? What you're trying to do is we're trying to abstract some real life phenomena, right? So if you think about this pendulum where this person is swinging on the pendulum, you can either have a symbolic abstraction, which is kind of like an equation which many may have, may have done in kind of in a, in a school or college, or you can have a visual abstraction. And, and both of them are actually layers of abstraction because we're abstracting a real life phenomena into either visual and symbolic. And symbolic is something that a computer may be very good at. Visual is something that we are probably likely to be better at, right? So visualization at its heart is just a process of transformation of the symbolic into the geometric, right? So well, let's talk about how to do this, right? I'm going to talk about this in four different contexts. I'm going to talk about it in a small data context. Then I'm going to make it a slightly bigger data. So let's call it large data. Then we're going to talk about a little bit of big data because everybody will say, how do you visualize big data? So we'll, I'll illustrate it a little bit on that. And then given time, we'll go through wide data in the sense that data which is more, uh, more number of columns, so more number of variables, rather than now more number of observations. So what to do when we do that, right? Feel free to ask questions and keep this interactive. OK, so we'll start with the smallest possible data set that you can think of, right? So five observations, uh, a very simple data set. Um, Area, north, east, west, south, central. So you know you have a categorical variable and you have some cells. Rupees can be made to SGD, USD, whatever, and you have this number. Right? It's the smallest possible data set you have, right? So if you were to visualize it, let's say, how would you do that? How many ways can you visualize it? Let's slate. What would as a question to anyone, how how would you visualize this data set? Loudly, loudly, anyone? Pie chart, okay, what else? Histogram, okay, probably not, but bar chart, okay. One more. <coughs> Heat map, okay, that probably would be hard also. What else? One more. Bubble chart, okay, bubble chart, okay. So three. So, okay, any, we would probably come up with three, four ways. It's probably not hard to do that, right? And let's take something as simple as a bar chart. How do you make a bar chart? How do you make a bar chart? Nobody's asked me this question. You drop it in Excel, and it makes it for me, right? So <laughs> I don't need to think about how the bar chart is being made. The bar chart is really being made by its own, right? Uh, but let's break the process, right? So if you were to think about breaking this process of how a chart is made, you probably acquire the data, which means in this case you put it in Excel, right? And then you literally parse the variables, which also you would do in Excel. You would say something is an X and something is Y, right? In this case, X is a categorical variable, so we have five categories, one, two, three, four, five. And Y is a quantitative variable where Q is sales, right? So we're saying X and Y, we've done that. Then we actually choose a shape, and we say, I want to encode X as position, so I want x to be positions. I want y to be a bar. And I want to do it in a space which is, say, 200 by 200 pixels. right? So if you do that, you encode the shape, you select the scales, you probably would have a table like this. And then you map it to a coordinate system. So once you map it to a coordinate system, then you get your, in this case, Cartesian, where x is pointing this side, y is pointing on the top, and you get a bar chart. Right? This is how Excel does it. This is like any visualization tool would do it. But this is the process if we unpack the process of uh, visualization. Now, this is really powerful, because if you understand this process, then there's much more you can do, right? So we talked about, we talked about three probably here in the group, or you know, maybe we stretch our mind four or five. I'm going to do 20 very quickly. And I'm going to show you, once you know this process, how easy it is to go that. Suppose you want to visualize it, the data point as a point, as a line, as like a thicker line in this case, which is a bar or also change the position of x to make it bar stacked or bar staggered, right? So we have five different ways to encode it. Encode basically means convert that variable into a, into a shape, right? And position in this case. So shape, we're playing just with shape and positions. And we choose a coordinate system, right? So if we do that, we get five charts, right? So we get a dot plot, we get a line chart, we get a column chart, we get a stacked column, we get a waterfall and we got five charts, right? With me? OK. Now, it's easy to cheat and make another five. 
So we can flip the coordinate system. And I'm cheating because Excel will also cheat and give you all these options, so I'm cheating. Uh, and you can flip it, and you can probably have you know, a bar chart, a stack bar. And some of these don't have names, so we have to come up with names. So instead of calling it a waterfall, I'm now calling it cascade, just to make it more uh, you know, appealing. We can also change the coordinate system. So instead of going just car, instead of using just x and y as perpendicular, we can make x as angle and y as <coughs> radius, right? So you would then get something like a mock radar, line radar, coxcom, bullseye, and since we are making up names, polar waterfall, right? Because it's a polar <laughs> axis, right? And we can cheat again. So we flip now instead of plotting x because we've done a polar coordinate, but you know, we didn't get the pie chart, so we have to get the pie chart. To get the pie chart, we flip it, right? So we say, wow, y is equal to angle and x is equal to radius, and that's what we're mapping. And when we do that, we get track, target, line, windrows, everybody's favorite pie chart, and polar cascade, right? This is just 20 visualizations with the simplest possible data set that you can think of, right? Obviously, if you increase the number of columns, if you increase the number of rows, do different visualizations, you know, this thing will completely explode, right? So if you look at the database process for a very small data set, it's acquire the data, parse the variables, encode it into a shape, select scales, and render coordinates, right? Very simple. Once you do this, you can do any kind of visualization. You can write your own visualization systems, and you can keep doing this, right? Now, this is not new. It's not like I have discovered this process and I'm standing here and talking about it. This is one of the uh, grammars or graphics which is written by Leland Wilkinson. Um, it's, I think, written originally by the second edition is 2005. And if you are using any of these tools like R or Julia and you use not base graphics in R but ggplot2, then this is what happens at the back. If you use Gatfly and Julia, then this is happening at the back. Python doesn't really have a good uh, visualization system based on this, so the closest you will have is Bokeh, which is inspired by it, but not really, uh, doesn't use it fully, so it doesn't use the grammar. So because that's not the only way, but that's one way to do it, right? Um, so that's small data, okay? Yeah? Questions? Okay. Large data. So let's make it a little bigger as a data set and see what happens then. Right. So I'm going to I'm going to visualize a slightly larger data set. There are roughly about 2,400 pin codes in India. So pin codes are the equivalent of postcodes or zip codes, wherever you come from. And uh, and the data set is very simple. It's a pin code which is a, a number, a six-digit number in this case, five six zero zero seven six. And there's probably a latitude or longitude to do that. And then there is a place name, right? So the data set is just a table of these four columns, right? But it's large in the sense that there are about 24,000 of this, right? So how do we do that? We can just plot each point as on X and Y, right? So that's all we're doing. We're taking a data set and we're plotting it and we're plotting each data set. And if you were to do that and create literally like a scatter plot, forget the coordinate system, just plot X and Y as latitude, longitude, and put the dot. And if you play a little bit with alpha, which is the transparency of the dot, in the sense that the more dots there are, the more brighter orange it is, the less dots there are, the more blacker it looks, you can start to see the, see the geographic nature of the pin codes, where pin codes are coordinated, where they're located. So we have created kind of a proxy geographic plot or a scatter plot in this case, just by playing with uh, alpha in this case, the transparency, right? So this is 24,000 data points now plotted, right? But pin codes are geographic in nature, and the first digit in five, for example, stands for something. So if you want to actually show the geographic nature, you'll find that if you color it according to the first digit, then you can start to see the state boundaries around which a lot of the pin codes are based on, right? So the actual visualization process is actually very iterative. We don't, we don't make one graph or we should not be making only one graph. We should be making many visualizations to understand the data and explore it, right? So we want to be, have this process of defining the data, plotting it again, defining the data, plotting it again to see what insights we're getting. Because at, at the one essence, mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is build better hypotheses around our data or understand the data much better, right? So to do that, you would probably need some amount of refinement of the data and plotting it again, right? So the, 
Database process for a large data is more like you acquire the data, you parse the variable, you probably do some refinement, which is transformations, filtering, or aggregation, some kind of refinement, then again encode into shapes, select scales, and render content, right? With me? Okay. Let's go to big data. So, what do we do with big data? I'm not going to talk a lot about big data, but I'll just touch upon it so you understand <laughs> that the, what the process behind it is, right? Suppose we want to visualize a million data points, and we're going to choose random X and Y, two random data points. Um, and just plot it, right? So if you were to just plot it, and no amount of, and you want to plot entire data, because you can obviously aggregate it down and say this is the mean and this is the variance, and that's just one data point. But visualization is really powerful, because we, we, can, we want to see the entire data, or as much data as possible, right? So if you were to plot it, uh, no amount of alpha treatment is going to help you. Because once you keep plotting on top of each other, you would basically get this blob of orange in this case, right? And uh, so, and that's also because at some point the number of pixels I have to play with actually also starts. So my MacBook here would have roughly an order of about 1.4 million pixels, right? And I have a million data points already here, right? So the ability for me to maneuver actually is very limited once I kind of finish the space that I have, the physical space or the pixel space that I have, right? So what can I do? What can I do? Say? Say it loudly. Sum. Subsetting. Sampling. OK, good. So sampling is the first one. You obviously can sample it. And as long as you're sampling it with some effectiveness, so sampling is not an easy thing, because you need to sample it with some carefulness that you are overweighting for unusual values. You don't lose the context of it. You can sample and plot it. Then that's great you can probably start to see it. What else can we do? There's probably two more given the structure of that slide, right? We can filter it. Filter it, okay, filter is like sampling. Like, if you do some intelligent filtering, that's nothing different than sampling. Say loudly, because I... Heat map. Clustering it, okay, heat map, okay. Can we show more dimensions? We're struggling with two dimensions. You want to show more dimensions this moment? Okay, so some of these ideas that we can model it, right? We can model it or kind of aggregate it down at a model level to show it, right? Because models are great. That's why all of this big data works, because model scales very nicely once you have a model of the data it doesn't really matter how big the data set is, right? The model itself scales very nicely. And the model is great because it answers the first level of ignorance, right? So this is the difference between modeling and visualization. Modeling answers the first level of ignorance. It's just like, I don't know. <sighs> so yeah, I, I don't know what I don't know, right? So that's, sorry, that's the second level of ignorance. In the sense, I don't know what I don't know, I want to visualize it because I have no hypothesis. If I know what I don't know, which is what modeling does, I can model it, because, because then I have some hypothesis on which I can start to build a model and test it out, right? But visualization is really great when you have no clue about the data. Suppose you've been given a data set and you don't know anything about it. How do you form any hypothesis around it? How do you figure out what, what is this data? What are these variables, right? Especially if people do go on Kaggle competition where everything is largely anonymized, and then they say, You've stripped away all context about the data. Now you're trying to help me solve it. You have to visualize it to some extent to at least form some level of understanding about the data. And that's why modeling uh, visualization is greater or more useful there because you then get a sense of what are my hypotheses. So I don't know what I don't know, then you need to visualize it, right? The other one, which is what you, somebody said heat map or binning. So binning is the, if you really want to show everything, right? Uh, binning is ultimately what you'll boil down to, because to visualize at a certain large data set, say a million or even more than that, you literally have to bin the data. And if you don't, if you start to bin it in some intelligence ways, then you can start to see the pattern. So heat map 
kind of binning is what you would like to do. And there are many papers on this. Bin Summarize Smooth is a framework for visualizing big data. It's like Hadley Wickham. Anybody who uses R would probably know him. He has a paper in which he uses, I think, just a MacBook Air, a MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM to visualize 100 million data points, right? And this whole framework of Bin Summarize Smooth. Jeffrey here and his team also does a lot on real-time querying. So those are kind of interesting things to do it, right? So binning is what we end up doing. And binning is nothing new. Because binning is what is the first thing you learn when you start to visualize. The first thing in grade five or six you would have learned is you know, how to draw a histogram, right? Histogram is what you draw. Like you're a birthday party, there's so many people, how would you show the data? You'd say, okay, I will create some bins and draw it, right? But now if you were to ask you how to draw histograms, probably many will not be familiar with. Because as a tool, it's not something that Excel has built in or is the easiestly built in, right? So tools matter in that way in the sense that if we don't use that skill, we kind of atrophies out. So nobody would say histogram now because that's not a default in, say, a very popular Excel tool, for example. It's probably a default in many of the visualization tools, right? So Amanda Cox, who is the New York Times graphic editor, said we're calling 2015 the year of the histogram. And if I was to paraphrase, I would say visualizing big data is just the process of creating generalized histograms, right? So if you want to create big data visualizations, you have to figure out a way to, <coughs> way to create generalized histograms. And a lot of the tools that are around that are really built around how I can create faster aggregates, pre-compute aggregates, columnar data. They're all built around this fact that I want to create faster aggregates, and hence I can then visualize it. Not, not only visualize it, but visualization will work that way, right? So if you were to look at data as process for big data, it's just still the same. We acquire the data, parse the variables, filter the data, aggregate it, encode it into shapes, select skills, or render coordinates. OK? I can stop here. I think this covers big, small, large. Or if you want, I can do wide data. Yes, please. First question of the day. Yes. OK, so then we will go to the next one. OK, <laughs> so how do we do wide data? Yes, OK. Trust me, I didn't plant that question. That was. Um, <laughs> So wide data, okay, so wide data is, what is wide data, right? Wide data is that you have, typically right now we're talking X and Y, right? So X and Y are two variables. Uh, and when we talk about multi-dimensional data, we were basically saying there are N, if N is the number of observations, and right now we were talking about N in the order of five, N in the order of 2,000, 20,000, N in the order of a million, right? Now we're saying we have many more columns or P's, right? If you say P is the dimensions. So that is why multi-dimensions would mean, right? And to do multi-dimensions, there are many approaches to do that, right? So you can start from very standard approaches, glyph approaches, geometric transforms, stacking, pixel-based, right? And I'll cover some of them to kind of give you a sense of. The Borard idea is that as you move from left, or I guess my right to left, the need for interaction goes up, right? The ease of interpretation goes down. Right? So if you want to interpret, obviously easier to interpret standard Cartes, you know, Cartesian 2D, 3D, harder to interpret pixel-based approaches, for example. Right? So we'll cover a little bit of, so to give you a sense of what it means. Right? So I'm going to use a very simple data set called Diamond's data set. How many of you have used R? How many of you know about Diamond's data set? OK. How many of you know about Diamond's? I thought everyone would learn. <laughs> OK, so diamonds, if you know, uh, it, the data set is very simple. But it's also good because it's a larger data set. So it's about 10 dimensions, 50,000 plus data points. So a decently large data set. Okay? And it's basically the price of diamonds. And the price of diamonds, as many of you who have bought it may know, depends on five variables, the, or the four Cs. right? So carrot, which is kind of the weight of the diamond, cut, in the sense of whether it's fairly cut to ideal cut, color, and then kind of clarity, which is like, if is, are the inclusions in it small inclusions, or is it internally flawless when then you pay a bomb for the diamond, right? So those are the four dimensions in price. And since we also want to show how big the diamond is, we probably have an X, Y, and Z to kind of show the dimensions. 
And then because a diamond is not a box, it has a taper on the top and a taper on the bottom, so there is depth and taper, right? So we have 10 variables in this data set. So a data set looks like this, which is, so let's say $326 is the price, it's 0.23 carat, diamond, ideal cut, color E, clarity, small inclusion two, and then the dimensions of that diamond. Okay, so fairly simple data set, we can use that to kind of look through many of these techniques. Obviously, uh, one, three of them are categorical variables, so carrot, sorry, cut, color, and clarity, in the sense they are uh, categories, and the rest are quantitative, right? So, so we've got seven which are quantitative, three which are categorical. Clear? Yeah? Okay. So let's start with the simplest. One and two dimension. This is very simple. Anybody who's done any kind of statistical tool would know how to do it. So I won't really spend time on this. Uh, but there are basically five combinations that are possible, right? You can have a one-dimensional quantitative, one-dimensional categorical, or the combinations of those. So quantitative, 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 categorical, 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 right? And since I taught you, or at least showed you, how to think about visualizing it, we can visualize it as a point, we can visualize it as a line, we can visualize it as a bar, we can visualize it as an area, right? So let's say we chose five different ways, four different ways to show it. If you were to look at that, then you would get most of these common kind of visualization structures, right? So you would have in a 1D quantitative a strip plot where you're plotting each point, or if you aggregate it, histograms, frequency polygon, density plots, right? If you have categorical, again, you would have a dot plot or a bar chart, and then it's very hard to do anything with lines and areas. And if you're in the 2D quantitative list categorical, you can again do a strip plot with a little bit of jitter to kind of make it show like that. You can obviously aggregate and do box plots, frequency polygons, density plots. If you have categorical and categorical, then points and lines are not possible, but you can definitely do bar charts of various combinations. So it could be staggered, it could be stacked, it could be 100%, so many combinations there. Or if you want to show the tool in an area way, you would probably do a mosaic plot, or if anybody is from business side, marry, macro plots kind of thing. If you do 2D quantitative plus quantitative, you have scatter plot, as if you're representing everything as a point, that's bulk of the examples. Or you can do table lenses for bars, slope graphs for lines, hard to do anything with area, right? This is all simple stuff. I mean, even if you're not familiar with some of them, that's fine, you can figure it out, it's not really hard. Um, but we'll want to go more, right? Because 2D is probably something that we're familiar with. So we want to say how to go more. And we'll try and go from two to all the way up, right? So we'll start with something like a scatter plot, which is the most common one you would do, right? So you want to do 2D scatter. You'd say price is here on the x axis, or on the y axis, and carrot is on the y axis, right? Uh, and if you are doing statistical stuff, we'll obviously look at this and say this is not linear. Oh, sorry, so we may look at outlier points, in this case, these faint points you're trying to look at, so you may interact with the data, say, okay, what are outliers, what are not outliers? And most logically, you'll start and you'll do a log transform to say, okay, there's a clear relationship between price and carrot. So you've transformed by price, and you've transformed carrot on a log-log basis, so now you know that it's a linear relationship, which makes sense. I mean, the carrot, as the weight of the diamond goes up, the price goes up, right? So this is kind of our base starting point. Okay, yeah? So you can obviously zoom in and filter, all that stuff is important because the idea here is to build hypothesis on the data, right? So you want to be able to interact with a lot of this stuff. So you may do pan and zoom to say, okay, this is the focus area I want to zoom in, right? But we want to really talk about 3D, That's, that was the question, right? So how do we go from beyond that? So what can we do to move from two to three? What can we do to go from two to three? This is simple. Add color, okay, that's one. What else? Size, what else? Orientation, yeah, can you put in? You can always make a movie, so time. Move with time, okay, but not available in this data set? I don't have time as available, but yes, you could do time. Okay. No, 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 it's just that if you want to map on time axis, so you can have your plot in 3D and then you start moving it. Because obviously it's rather hard to perceive something that doesn't move. Right, fair enough. Time. So that's that's orientation, that's what he said. Okay, fair enough, good. So let's look at these options. We've got, we've got uh, size, we've got color, we've got orientation, right? 
uh, on with movement, orientation with movement, right? That's what, okay. Yeah, orientation is a simple example when you map it on, say, polar coordinates. Yeah. We can map it on... <coughs> Going then. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Correct, correct. So we'll start with the simple ones using aesthetics for 3D. So aesthetics means you say choose size or sh color, and then we can also use shapes, different shapes to show data points. So here's an example in which we've taken kind of a log of XYZ to kind of show the size, and you can start to see that the smaller data points are on the bottom, the larger data points are on the top, right? So the, the size of the diamond in this case is literally showing how big the diamond is, right? The size of the circle, right? So size is one way to do for quantitative. You can also do color. So for categorical, for example, if you choose color and say D, E, F, G, H, I, J, A colors, you can start to see the stratification on the colors to say, okay, there are clearly, color has an impact, the more uh, expensive ones are on the top, the more, you know, the, the colors that are not good are on the bottom, there is some price difference. So price and color is the easiest way to do that one. You can also do shapes, and this shapes doesn't really scale very well with large data. So suppose I want to use different shapes to show fair, good, uh, very good premium ideal cuts. Even with a small amount of data sets, you can't really make out the shape. So shapes doesn't really scale very well. So size and color are the two options that you have, right? That was his point. Now, you can obviously do depth perspective in the sense that you, why we can our orientation, as somebody said, x and y is on these two mm -hmm. dimensions. I choose z as a dimension going in, literally as an isometric drawing, right? And it doesn't really work in this case because the moment I do this, obviously I can't see the points behind it, right? I can't really see the points behind it, in which is what his argument was that we need to then have some amount of interaction to it, right? So you need it to rotate. So you need it to interact in a way that you can, so if you want, really want to do 3D, and I don't really prescribe it too much, but if you really want to do 3D, then you need to have use a tool which allows you to do some level of interaction. Because, because otherwise the points are really hidden and you can't do much with that data set, right? Good. So we've done three. Let's go up. Four to six. OK, now what do we do? So you can add density. You can add density. What does density mean? Alpha channel. In 3D, alpha, alpha channel. To a more and less dense. OK, oh, but alpha is already here. Alpha is already here as the channel. In the color, I'm already adding alpha. Otherwise, I won't see the points. Because if I don't add alpha, I can't see 50,000 points. They'll just be. Yeah, but that, that's your point that without aggregation, you cannot do anything with such large. Right? No, no, this is still without aggregation, okay. just using alpha. But yeah, yeah, yeah correct, correct. Alpha aggregation. Yeah, this is. Oh. So many pixels. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, fair enough. Like fair enough. Thousand, like thousand, by thousand. Sure, sure. Your eye has lower resolution. Fair enough. Correct. So, but, OK, so aggregation is one option. We're not exploring that. The idea is still to show as much data points as we can. Um, what can we do? Combine the other options. Combine it. Combine. Oh, combine it. Okay, so again, dimensionality reduction. I'm not going to talk about that, but that's a valid statistical technique. At beyond. Yeah, combine the techniques, for example, the, the color 3D things. Ah, right. Okay. So combine color and size together. Okay, that's one. What else? Okay, let's start with that. So combine it. Good point. Color and size, do both of them together, you have four dimensions, right? You now have color and size, and you're representing four variables together. What can else can I do? If it's like five or six categories, so low discrete number of categories, you can basically split it, make the projections in the sixth dimension. Okay, so we can split it. What is it called? Projection. Projection? Okay, close. Well, okay, so one is time. If you had time as the other option, Sorry, before we go into that, you could actually just move the time axis and see different projections, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not covering part of it, but one way to do is animation you to can some. You also do it up to 50 and dimension, and six is projection, so you have the rotating. <laughs> okay, so I'm not a big fan of 3D, because I find it really hard to interpret. Most tools are not really good at doing it, so I really avoid 3D. But within the 2D space, and you can obviously add third dimension, and obviously that adds another layer to it. You can split it. So we've not played with the area. We're drawing one chart so far. But you can actually make what is called uh, small multiples in graphic design, what is called trellising or faceting. 
you can actually split the chart into six or seven each category charts. So you can basically get uh, small multiples, so now you have another variable on this dimension. And since we are splitting the space and creating more things, we can actually split it both ways, right? So we can have one dimension on the top, one on the right, and we have so many charts, and we can start to see the patterns differently, right? So you can do actually more or five variables in this way fairly easily, or even six, no, six of this, right? Say again? Where's the price? Oh, price is on that axis. So price is this axis. Carrot is this axis. The dots are color in this case, or the size of the dots. Oh no, just the color. And then you have one more axis and one more axis on the top. These are just small charts, right? And we've created a subset of that, taken the subset of the data set and plotted that chart. Does that make sense? No? Okay, let me show you this. So if you were to take this previous chart, or let's just create, for, for D color, you just draw one chart. For E color, you draw one chart. So we take the dimension of the variable and then create that many number of charts. That's one way to overcome, because now we have many charts, we can show different projections or different projections or different filters of that tool, right? Different filters of that data set. It obviously works only if you have six or seven of them. If you have many of them, then you'll have to figure out a way to do it. You can also orient it in different ways. So if you have less variables, you can do scatter plot metrics. That's also a very common technique, plot. What else can we do? What else can we do? Clustering and transformation. Say again? Clustering and transformation. Clustering and transformations, yeah. Sure, yeah, yeah we can. Any other ideas? Any other thoughts? So clustering or binning to some extent, and you can use that, is one way. I mean, there are, I'm not going too deep into clustering and binning and all that, because there's a whole dimension of dimensionality reduction and kind of aggregation that I've touched upon. But there's one example. So you can bin it and kind of plot it. This is kind of like subplots done in that. What you can really do, actually, is to use the space is to create multiple charts, or different views of the data sets, different projections. So in this case, there is a histogram of price, of histogram of carrot, histogram bar chart for color, bar chart for clarity, bar chart for cut, diamonds, I think that's a box plot. We have a mosaic plot and a scatter plot. So you can create many charts and use the space. And if you can link them together, then you can actually look at the data in many dimensions. So if you have ability to say select something, which is called linking and brushing. You select that area, you can see where the data points are all across that chart. So that's the other way to overcome, because at one, some point the space is limited, right? So we can't really keep subdividing the space or adding. So we add interaction and we kind of, we can do this. So this is really one of the powerful ways to do, which is kind of interaction or brushing and linking to do that, right? Uh, Unfortunately, a lot of the tools we use are not really designed for this. So, you know, if you use RStudio or if you use Python notebooks, they're not really very good at showing multiple views or to do it, right? So this, for example, is done in a very simple tool called Mondrian, which is just a very simple tool to do multidimensional visualizations. Uh, but most of R or Python notebook style doesn't really promote this kind of things, which is why you probably need to think of some other tools to do that, right? Or Tableau or some of the dashboard tools may be better at doing this. Than, than traditional data science tools to some extent, right? Okay. Should I go on or I think? Enough, <laughs> enough. Okay. So how do we do six or more? I, I'll do one or two more and then we'll stop because I think the idea is to just inspire people to think that there is lots to visualization. And once you kind of start looking at this, you can do that, right? So one of the approaches is kind of glyph-based in the sense you'd use icons to show each dimensions, right? So suppose you were to take a simple star icon and, or in this case, you know, color, cut, table, depth, clarity, and plot it as icons. You have a kind of a matrix layout, and then you can impose it on top of price and carrot, and you can start to get some interesting stuff, right? So that's one approach is you have to figure out whether it works for your data set or not, but you know, kind of that star plot is one way to do it. 
And the other approach is really to break this orthogonality and do what is called as parallel plots, right? So you can really, really plot all the 10 dimensions if you don't have to use perpendicular dimensions to show it. If you plot it in a very linear fashion, you can actually plot all the 10 dimensions as, as what is called a parallel coordinate. So all the 10 dimensions are plotted, each data point is connected as a line all the way across, and obviously it works very well to kind of see relationships next to each other, but if you have ability to sort them or interact with them, you can start to see a lot of this data set. Right. Um, I think I'll stop here, so I think <laughs> I will skip the rest and just kind of talk about what to do about database. Because, okay, so the idea is you can build on this and go to different approaches. Uh, the database process for a little bit of white data is like you have to think about kind of algorithms to render it, how to make the views, and add interactivity. Interactivity is really the good thing that actually helps you to do a lot of this interaction, uh, multi-dimensional visual visualizations, right? Um, and the kind of, you need to think about what to encode very wisely, so which variable is what encoding, and encoding really means what visual variable you're using to encode the variable. You use the space and multiples, interestingly, add interactivity if you want, and then obviously reduce dimensions, and the dimension reduction is also one way to kind of think about that, right? So uh, all of this stuff is done in R, all the slides, you can go to my GitHub uh, and you can see the code for all of this. Uh, all of these, uh, more or less all of them are done in, uh, in R. So you can actually just go to multi-dim, which is the repository, and you can see the code behind many of these libraries to kind of do that. Right? The greatest value of a picture is when it forces us to notice what we never expected to see. This is John Tukey, the guy who kind of kick-started EDA, Exploratory Data Analysis. And uh, yeah, so I want people to kind of do more visualization, know that it can help you learn more about the data, you know, do much more of it, get more comfortable around it. And if you can, uh, you know, figure out kind of the basics around it, and then you will see that your range of visualization as a language will improve, and you can be able to look at data in much more interesting ways. Um, these are the two websites I have, amitcaps.com, which is kind of like a personal website, and narrativeviz.com, which is where I do, um, mostly what I do is actually more storytelling with data or crafting visual stories with data, so I work in this kind of intersection of data, story, and visuals. Um, amitcaps is what I am pretty much everywhere, so if you want to follow on Twitter or basically Twitter, that's the best thing. Um, and uh, I'm gonna make one plug. So I'm doing a workshop tomorrow at GA on storytelling with data. So if anybody's interested uh, at General Assembly, so I think they're, <coughs> let me just check if I have the page. Yeah, so I'm doing a storytelling with data workshop which has got nothing to do with data science to some extent, it's much more in the business context, but thinking about telling stories with data. So if anybody's keen to sign up, then you can come at seven to nine tomorrow at Working Capital, NXC3. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, we'll just, any questions? Just take one, oh, yeah. Right, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I'm more curious about what's the process for scaling. So you kind of have to hold it. What's the process for scaling as like creating many visualizations? Yeah. I mean, you have so many uh, kind of visualizations. Yeah, so I guess I guess one of my because I come from a background where I typically deal with larger data sets, which are not, you know, too many dimensions or too many uh, lengths. I, I'm actually okay to kind of create a lot of visualization myself. Uh, and you know, just look at the data and test my hypothesis and do that. Uh, but there are also a lot of work being done on kind of automated, because automated visualization, and because the real cost in visualization is the person who has to come and see the visualization, right? So there are tools which will do some amount of selection, some amount of sorting for you to say, okay, here are the interesting views that I want a human to come and look at, right? That's only how you can scale visualization, because the cost 
of creating visualization is not that much, but the cost is really when somebody has to look at 100 variables and each combination of that 100 C2, that's already a large set of uh, visualizations to look at, right? So there are a lot of work being done on automated analysis to kind of winnow down what is the interesting views that you want the audience or you want the user to come and look at that. I don't do too much work in that space. I'm more interested in kind of grafting stories with data, so kind of I focus a lot more on creating visualization and then trying to think about a narrative in which I can leave them. Uh, and in which case, you, I may create 100, but narrow down to two or three interesting and then tell it, right? So I'm willing to do that much time and spend it. But yes, if you have a data set like that, that's a separate problem, and you'll find enough people are working on that to kind of help solve that. Okay, so uh, I think that's all for today. Uh, thank you very much for attending.